How's it everyone? Jay here. In this video expedition we will examine the Expanse solar system map and the events that shaped the orbits and territories of the planetary powers covering 157 years starting with the Martian independence and Vesta blockades at the dawn of the 23rd and 24th centuries, spawning an interplanetary arms race that fueled the multi-generational Earth-Mars conflict. The year is 2225 and a long simmering interplanetary independence movement has broke out into open confrontation. 130 years prior to season 1, Mars was a planetary colony of the United Nations with a population of just over 2 billion Earth settlers and pioneers. Nearly a quarter of the asteroid belt had been prospected with a network of infrastructure dedicated to terraforming the Martian biosphere to one day have an Earth-like atmosphere to ease the burden of the overpopulated homeworld. Terraforming Mars into a Blue Earth 2.0 will be the largest endeavor in all of human history, spanning over 200 years into the 25th century. The United Nations of Earth and Luna consists the primary planetary governing body. The asteroid belt contains numerous trade ports and refinery stations with the largest being Ceres, Tycho, Pallas and Eros industrial hubs on the new frontier now expanding to the outer planetary Jovian moons of Ganymede, Callisto and Titan with more outpost settlements under construction stretching to the gas giant moons of Oberon and Triton. As millions of settlers from the inner planets embark on long and harsh journeys in search of economic opportunities and employment towards the edge of the solar system. Over the past few decades, near the end of the 22nd century, a new political separatist movement gained popular momentum across Mars, with strong support throughout the provincial government and colonial authorities petitioning the United Nations Oversight Committees for Martian Commonwealth status, equivalent to that of Luna and the territorial trade zones on Earth, as an equal member of the UN Planetary General Assembly as a self-governing body with delegate representatives elected by Martian citizens to replace colonial officials appointed by Earth Corporation lobbyists on the oversight committees that focus on profit margins for corporate investors and positive quarterly reports that have become increasingly unpopular each year with the Martian colonists. In 2218, the Martian Commonwealth proposal was drafted and approved for ratification by a two-thirds majority vote in the United Nations General Assembly. 252 delegates representing trade zones and colonial territories cast 140 ballots in favor, 77 against, with 35 abstains, defeating the Commonwealth Resolution by only three votes, retaining Mars as colonial status. With common knowledge of widespread corruption in the General Assembly of Law, obvious swaying delegates through economic and monetary incentives caused the separatist leadership within the Martian military to declare independence. Within a matter of days, three colonial fleets seceded from Earth Command forming the Mars Corps Navy as the UNN admirals and flag officers stepped down or were relieved of duties to be sent back to Earth. Vesta and Juno stations along with the Callisto shipyards soon followed suit as the news spread through the asteroid belt as the entirety of the outer Martian colonies separated into an independent force of 220 naval vessels, three belter stations, and a Martian Galilean and moon. The colonial parliament of Mars remained neutral along with the planetary fleet to maintain diplomatic order in hopes of de-escalations towards a political compromise or solution with Earth to avoid a military confrontation after five days of the first interplanetary crisis. The United Nations Secretary General and Security Council invoked wartime emergency powers in an attempt to prevent the Martian succession through diplomacy as Earth fleets mobilized for action. After a four-day deliberation, an ultimatum was conveyed to the Martian colony. Because this was a naval secession separate from the planet's provisional administration, Mars would be granted a probational 90-day Commonwealth status, allowing for 41 delegates to have additional seats on the UN General Assembly after the separatist fleets returned to Martian ports and to surrender to UN authorities. Upon which a special session of the UN General Assembly would vote a second time for permanent Martian Commonwealth status, but maintain the 
increase representation on the UN Interplanetary General Assembly. Three days later, the Mars colonial officials responded to the UN diplomatic envoys by declaring planetary independence with the first official act of the new republic uniting their colonial forces to form the Martian Navy with a combined fleet total exceeding some 300 ships. Despite the United Nations Navy losing nearly 20% of their forces to the Martian naval secession, Earth Fleet Command still maintained a 5 to 1 ship advantage deploying battle fleets towards Mars to reclaim their colonial planet. Yet the Generation 2 fusion drives of that era would take nearly 30 days to muster an adequate force to subdue the rebel fleets concentrated in Martian controlled space. After the failure of negotiations, the United Nations received reports from the rogue fleet's former commanders returning to Earth of a newly developed fusion drive in Martian ships. Over the following days, UN intelligence agencies discovered that over a third of Martian vessels were equipped with advanced Epstein drives that Mars had developed in secret over the past four years following Solomon Epstein's breakthrough test flight discovery. This new ultra speed advantage in sublight space travel would negate the UN Navy's overwhelming numerical superiority that could shift the upcoming battles in either direction during full scale fleet engagements. And within five years, the Martian technical edge could defeat Earth defenses minus a quick victory on the precipice of this interplanetary civil war. Five days before the UNN strike fleets were set to confront the Separatist Navy in rebel controlled space, standout orders were relayed to both forces. The one thing the leaders of Earth and Mars could agree upon was the likelihood of a military conflict escalating into an interplanetary nuclear exchange was too high of a risk. In 2225, a negotiated settlement had been achieved for an independent Martian planetary nation with a three-year plan for the transition of power, after which the Martian Republic would be officially recognized by the United Nations of Earth and Luna. Martian engineers would train UN specialists to replicate and produce the Epstein fusion drive along with working prototype and design schematics for this game-changing technological breakthrough to include working Epstein drives that have been previously in service. In exchange, Mars will be a self-governing military power and retain the 230 gunships from the colonial fleets along with 165 naval support vessels in the Martian Navy. Vesta and Juno research stations will remain under MCR jurisdiction, sharing terraforming and climate control technology with the UN for a period of 50 years as reimbursement for Earth Corps engineering and infrastructure used to excavate the asteroid port's construction. Mars will maintain the remaining asteroid belt zones designated for the terraforming project continuing under MCR jurisdiction as managed and maintained by colonial fleets over previous decades. The Callisto Naval Shipyard's operational development will be absorbed by the Martian Republic with the UN managing the Titan Station projects. Near the end of 2228, the Martian Commonwealth officially was recognized by the United Nations as the Martian Congressional Republic Planetary Nation with the Spaceborne Military Marine Corps and Fleet Arm of the Mars Republic Navy with official planetary treaties for defined orbits and borders. Over the next 75 years, the fourth generations of fusion drives cut solar system transit times by a factor of five, opening the door for practical colonization to the outer planets. Economic and defense competition between the interplanetary superpowers opened the floodgates for this new frontier, turning modest space industries into economic titans, fueling the expansion like never before seen in human history, steering Earth and Mars into the Cold War vacuum of space that would inevitably burn high which is what will be covered in part 3 of the Earth-Mars conflict known as the Vesta blockade at the dawn of the 24th century, 47 years before the Expanse Season 1. 35 years after planetary independence, by 2260 Mars had become a technological power on the rise and expanding as tens of thousands migrate from Earth every year, while the UN maintains the status quo to ensure the rest of the solar system's colonies remain loyal to the home world. Over the coming decades, Martian research and development programs rival that of the United Nations, with Vesta and Juno terraforming research stations along with the Phoebe science moon of Saturn. 
Ceres and Hygieia stations became economic trade hubs within the MCR zone of the asteroid belt. Mariner Valley and Callisto naval shipyards were producing the most advanced space vessels in the Sol system as Martian military power spawned a new arms race with the United Nations. At the turn of the 24th century, the MCR aggressively expanded their territory influence in the belt, laying claim to nearly 25% of the orbits with a strong influence in the Jovian system with an increasing presence near Saturn connected through their network of trade stations. Additionally, the Martian Navy underwent a massive shipbuilding program increasing their fleet to 354 naval combat and support ships with an additional force of 100 auxiliary reserve vessels. The United Nations controls over 35% of the asteroid belt with trade zones around Jupiter and Saturn and the recent expansion to the outer orbits of Uranus gas harvesting Oberon station with a network of 10 major trade stations across the solar system. This 80 year period of interplanetary colonial expansion by Earth and Mars was driven by the newest generation of Epstein fusion drives drastically decreasing ship transit times between planets. 20 additional stations and settlements were established around the new planetary trade zones as the Martian population doubled to 5 billion and 600 million settlers now considered the outer planet's home. A new political movement arose in these distant population centers of the solar system forming a network of labor unions to prevent exploitation in this new frontier of independent workforces. In 2303, the Martian parliament passed a charter recognizing the Outer Planets Alliance and their humanitarian institutions of self-regulating unions. The controversial clause in the charter stipulated any station or settlements within MCR controlled space could petition for planetary union status officially recognized by the Martian Parliament upon ratification. This was deemed a violation of interplanetary commerce treaties by the United Nations General Assembly who passed a resolution declaring the Martian Charter illegal and not recognized by the network of colonies. Within two months, Ceres and Hygieia stations applied for territorial union status that would make them self-governing proxy colonies of the Mars Congressional Republic with Aurora and Ganymede stations also lobbying for enrollment. Due to Ceres station sharing UN and MCR space and the agricultural moon of Ganymede split between the jurisdiction of Earth and Mars, the United Nations Navy responded by seizing control of Tycho station in the asteroid belt in the name of interplanetary security. Additionally, Earth annexed the Saturn ring system orbits and the UN Security Council demanded Mars relinquish the four territorial petitions or face additional actions. The Martian Republic denounced the annexations as Earth imperialism to take stations by force and granted territorial union status to all four petitions through a series of parliament sessions while approving an additional memorandum for the MCRN to survey the asteroid belt orbit around Aurora and Aero stations essential for the terraforming program's increased demand for resources. The UN Security Council considered this a declaration of economic war and publicly announced Earth intentions to prevent the Martian colonization of the asteroid belt for dominance over the major trade hubs in the inner planet backed with the full support of the United Nations General Assembly. Within the UN Security Council, many believe Mars understood only one thing, military force. In 2305, Earth Fleet Command was granted authorization for the proposed police action into MCR-controlled space to confront the Martian Political Trade Alliance. 110 gunships from the 2nd and 9th fleets would be positioned near Vesta's borders, blockading the primary terraforming supplies from the research station, with the 2nd task force of 65, 5th, and 6th fleet ships to reinforce the orbits of Ceres and Hygieia stations with a force projection transit schedule of two to three weeks. In response, the MCRN mustered 45 gunships from the home and second core fleets to secure and defend the Vesta trade routes and 38 ships from the Saturn and third fleets for the standoff confrontation around Ceres and Hygieia orbits. After 75 years of political and economic disputes with Earth trying to curb Martian expansion throughout the asteroid belt and Jovian systems that quickly became a direct competitor to the UN system-wide colonial trade network, now focusing on a group of rocks and planetoids in a cluster of orbits in the asteroid belt. 
Thus the research station was a crucial component of terraforming the Martian atmosphere. The time sensitive nature of this technological process meant any prolonged delays in logistical supplies could disrupt this delicate scientific balance and devastate the Martian economy. As quickly as the military mobilization began, the political leaders of Earth and Mars feared they had unleashed Pandora's box to interplanetary war. The longer the blockade lasted, increased the likelihood of an exchange of fire between fleets. After day 5 of the Vesta blockade, following three weeks of failed negotiations between Earth and Mars during the tense military transit of both planetary forces, half the UNN fleet, some 400 warships, burned closer to Mars in full-scale war. The MCRN began actively challenging the blockade with their new stealth cruisers, performing surveillance sorties on the UNN side of the fleet formation. In the midst of one such proximity maneuver, the Martian ship was detected in advance as five UNN destroyers quickly moved to intercept. Due to all six ships' hard burning maneuvers inside the no fly zone, they quickly became intertwined with one another's targeting solutions when an exchange of fire breaks out. In a matter of seconds, all five UNN destroyers and the MCRN cruiser were crippled or damaged before the admirals on both sides of the Vesta blockade were able to order a ceasefire three minutes later. Those long seconds broadcast the fog of war throughout the belt's conflict zones, causing the fleets around Ceres and Hygieia stations to launch a domino effect of torpedo and railgun volleys between Earth and Martian ships, resulting in an additional nine UNN and five MCRN vessels damaged through the barrages of point defense systems before the ceasefire 90 second transmission delay ordered by naval commanders to stand down over inner fleet wide beam channels. With the Earth strike force less than 48 hours away from reaching the orbit of Mars in an engagement beyond their control, the UNN and MCRN fleet admirals agreed to an emergency parley outside of their planetary government's chain of command. Unlike the Martian military secession 80 years prior, the interplanetary politicians were pushing for war during the Vesta blockade. The Martian Admiral briefed his UNN counterpart that five guided missile stealth prototype cruisers are positioned around Earth ready to launch strategic nuclear strikes on the UN's military and governmental chain of command when Earth's numerical ship advantages break through Martian defenses. This dialogue between admirals would reopen the diplomatic door to the United Nations and Mars Congressional Republic political leaders. 72 hours later, fleet de-escalations between the UNN and MCRN reached a compromise for the Vesta blockade, authorizing transit between the station only to official Martian naval vessels. While treaty negotiations were underway between the Earth and Martian government, despite Mars dedicating half of their economy on defense and increasing their naval forces, military leaders were surprised by the United Nations resolve to mobilize their navy for full-scale war to protect the neutrality of a few trade stations near MCR controlled space and the Martian parliament agreed to attempt a fair compromise with the UN to avoid a war that could result in the destruction of the MCR government. Following 45 days of negotiations, the leaders of Earth and Mars signed the interplanetary trade accords that defined the solar system borders and recognized the Outer Planetary Alliance as a humanitarian labor organization. Mars and Earth would retain their asteroid belt territories, including the stations and ports inside their respective zones. 35% of the total belt or orbits would be designated for current and future claims of the Mars Congressional Republic, with 40% under the jurisdiction of the United Nations of Earth and Luna. The remaining 25% would remain independent buffer zones between the interplanetary borders that included Tycho, Eros, Aurora, and Hygieia stations, allowing private industries to self-regulate and provide independent management and security for operational oversight committees with a 5-10 to 10 year transitionary period from interplanetary control. Outer Planetary Alliance Union Charters would be allowed corporate representation for each independent station. The Galilean Jovian moons would remain under MCR control. Ceres, the largest trade station and port in the solar system, would be a joint protectorate of Earth and Mars for security and trade routes, with a private contractor managing the station's operation. Ganymede would also be under joint jurisdiction of Earth and Mars along with the remaining moons of Jupiter. 
the primary orbit of Saturn would be a UN controlled zone with the MCR designated for the outer ring orbits. The remaining gas giants of Uranus and Neptune would be regulated by the UN to include the rimward outer planetary trade routes. The Vesta blockade swayed the Martian parliament to implement the fleet modernization program 50 year plan to develop and produce a Martian navy of new ultra advanced ship designs as demonstrated by the guided missile stealth cruiser prototypes to replace the upgraded UN naval ship classes whose conversions could no longer bridge the gap compared to Earth's massive fleet production capabilities. The Mars terraforming program would be delayed a full century to allocate planetary resources towards the military, industry, and advanced defense systems programs. Over the next 50 years, Earth and Mars continued to carve up the solar system with the newer and prosperous stations under interplanetary control, and older stations in need of upgrades and renovations auctioned off to megacorporations, with the OPA union charters being marginalized with bureaucratic regulations and corruption. By 2350, out of 100 stations, ports, and outposts, most of the trade locations in need of repair were controlled by the OPA, with only the primary stations of Hygieia and Tycho corporations owned and managed by outer planetary institutions, whose combined commerce and production industries represented less than 10% of the overall system-wide economic trade network. Around 10 years prior to the start of The Expanse Season 1, a monumental discovery on Phoebe, a remote science station around Saturn, would tip this delicate balance established over the past two centuries into a decade-long system-wide conflict and full-scale interplanetary war between Earth, Mars, the Belt, and outer planets for control of the proto-molecule. This and much more is covered in the next video in the Earth-Mars Conflict series titled Prelude to the UN-MCR War. this video expedition we will examine the earth mars conflict that transpires during season one and two of the expanse universe timeline year of 2350 through 2351 and the strategic military situation in the solar system that escalated into a full-scale interplanetary confrontation at the start of season three known as the UNMCR war unfolding during the year of 2352 through 2350 53 Seoul. At the start of Season 1, the United Nations Navy comprised of 1,700 combat vessels and 1,300 support ships, outnumbering the Martian Navy by a factor of nearly 5 to 1. The Mars Congressional Republic Navy had 360 warships and 270 support vessels, fewer in number but considerably newer and more advanced, with the majority of the Martian economy supported by the asteroid belt and Jovian moons of Jupiter in closer proximity of orbits, allowing the MCRN to concentrate their fleets, whereas the United Nations trade network spanned the entire solar system, stretching from Venus to the outer planetary gas giants of Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. At any given time, the UNN can deploy 1,000 ships to designated orbits and operational zones, compared to that of 250 Martian naval vessels, focusing on a smaller area of the solar system with a proportion amount of resources. The governments of Earth and Mars have been intertwined in a Cold War military arms race for over a hundred years after Mars seceded from the United Nations at the start of the 23rd century to form the planetary independent military power of the Martian Congressional Republic. In the middle of the year 2350 what escalated this conflict into motion was a rogue fleet of stealth warships destroyed an Earth core heavy transport near Saturn and 10 days later it overwhelmed and defeated the Donager flagship of the Martian Navy in the asteroid belt drastically increasing tensions between Earth and Mars and the outer planet as UNN and MCRN fleets dispatched warships to strategic locations throughout the solar system. 
Five weeks later, the MCRN assault cruiser Sirocco destroyed Saturn's moon Phoebe to prevent the UN Marines from landing on the research station that previously conducted a covert engineering program with the Protogen Science Division. Phoebe was a joint outpost of Earth and Mars causing political pressure in the United Nations Security Council warranting a response to what some considered to be an act of war by the Martian Republic. Threat conditions increased throughout the solar system as Earth and Mars imposed restrictions on their trade zones and navigation routes, redeploying fleets near orbital territories, leading to incursions and border skirmishes in high transit areas, resulting in 26 naval vessel altercations. 2350.244, the UN Security Council ordered Earth's orbital defenses to launch an interplanetary missile strike on the MCR Long Range Tracking Station on Deimos, destroying the small Martian moon in response to the Planet Buster attack on Phoebe Station. This propelled the conflict into the proxy trade war phase as both militaries engaged in unconventional warfare. The United Nations Naval Defense Department contracted privateer factions and mercenaries to raid Martian commerce vessels, awarding bounties on transponder codes and data cores for merchant tonnage lost from Martian trade ships. The Mars Naval Intelligence Division deployed their Special Operations Branch of stealth PT boats and armed patrol skiffs of older models with updated drives and systems to blend in with the thousands of planetary and commerce and trade ships. This force of 140 raiders inflicted significant disruptions on Earth's trade networks, intercepting up to 10 cargo vessels per day and enticing other opportunistic belter factions to join in on the UN raid parties. In the following weeks, the proxy war spread throughout the outer planets without Earth and Mars actively policing the trade route while undermining each other's merchant fleets. This led to Belter and privateer factions gaining extreme influence with the OPA as Earth and Mars competed for their support during this unconventional shadow conflict. 2351.265 In the asteroid belt, Aero Station and its population of 100,000 had been under strict quarantine from an unknown radiation biohazard leading to a central fusion core network overload and the resulting detonation knocking the station off orbit and propelling the planetoid sunward towards Earth. This caused the UN to launch half of their planetary defense nuclear arsenal with the asteroid narrowly missing Earth and impacting on Venus and Instead, emergency back-channel political communication avoided an interplanetary nuclear exchange between Earth and Mars during this Cold War gone hot, as both feuding governments publicly accused one another of causing the Eros incident, adding more fuel to the Earth and Mars shadow conflict. This drastically increased the commerce proxy war as more and more conventional naval warships became caught up in the raid, straying across borders and exchanging fire in the following engagements. During the first three months of the Earth-Mars proxy trade conflict, 10 MCRN gunships were lost with 20 more damaged along with 20 auxiliary Navy ship casualties. The United Nations Navy lost 56 ships and 81 damaged with over 500 merchant vessels from both sides suffering similar fate drastically impacting supply shipments beyond the asteroid belt. To prevent a humanitarian crisis in the outer planets, the primary moons of Jupiter and Saturn were designated as protectorate trade zones, making them the only remaining orbits jointly defended by Earth and Martian navies, while the rest of the solar system continues to grapple with trade embargoes, supply route restrictions, and ever-increasing commerce trade wars. 2351.285 In the Galilean humanitarian trade zone, the largest concentration of UNN and MCRN ships coalesced in low orbit above Ganymede due to the moon's primary food production for the outer planet. An unknown event on the surface caused UN and Martian Marines to exchange fire, cascading into a full-scale naval battle in orbit between front-line conventional warships, destroying the large mirror rays and severely damaging most of the ag domes on the surface. Nine UNN and six MCRN ships were lost in orbit. Due to the Mars fleet base on Callisto and strong naval presence in the inner moons, the MCRN claimed jurisdiction over the Galilean orbit, while the UNN Jupiter fleet withdrew to the outer Jovian system. 
In less than a week, the trade war expanded towards the inner planets and throughout the asteroid belt with Earth and Mars seizing control of critical trade stations and ports near their spheres of orbital influence. The United Nations and Mars Republic prepared for full-scale armed mobilization deploying their fleets to combat status throughout the solar system as more naval ships directly clashed in the neutral zones and along planetary borders with a proxy war drawing dangerously close to interplanetary conflict. By now, the solar system's commerce industries could no longer be subsidized by Earth and Mars to recoup their combined economic losses as lobbyists from the merchant industries threatened to build their own gunship security fleet and withdraw from the interplanetary trade accords. Additionally, the proxy war could no longer remain hidden from the public media amidst the aftermath of the Ganymede incidents as widespread protests were mounted on Earth and even amongst patriotic Martian populations relations, while Earth and Mars intelligence agencies raced against the clock to obtain protomolecule research technology. Trade war skirmishes in the inner orbits continued for another 30 days after the Ganymede incident before political and economic pressure forced an official ceasefire ending conventional naval hostilities in preparation for a peace summit between Earth and Mars leaders to be held at the District of New York Planetary Embassy Center. After the nearly six-month-long Earth-Mars conflict, the MCRN lost 21 gunships with 20 damaged and additional 35 auxiliary support ships destroyed or knocked out of action. UNN casualties were 86 ships lost and 104 rendered non-mission capable. Over 3,000 merchant vessels from Earth, Mars, and outer planetary industries were lost, raided, destroyed, or commandeered, making this the most costly period in solar system history. Between Seasons 2 and 3, at the start of 2352, following 44 days of a ceasefire, re-establishing security trade routes and peace negotiations for treaty stipulations abruptly ended when a lone Amun Ra-class stealth warship destroyed the MCRN Karakum, a Special Operations 3rd Fleet Corvette over Ganymede. The United Nations Navy Jupiter Fleet was unaware of a shoot-down order as Deputy Undersecretary Earnwright authorized the mission outside the chain of command in a private type beam protogen frequency causing conflicting rules of engagement for Earth Fleet Command. The MCRN Jupiter Fleet swiftly responded with a coordinated counterattack, inflicting heavy losses on the disorganized UNN ships. In less than an hour, both fleets switched from relief operations over the agricultural moon into full-scale combat engagements. As the battle raged in orbit, 36 UNN ships were destroyed with 68 more damaged as the conflict spread throughout the Jovian system. The MCRN Jupiter fleet lost 11 ships and 10 damaged as the Mars 7th patrol fleet pressed the counterattack from outer orbits preventing UNN ships from regrouping. Over the next five days, MCRN fleet reinforcements drove the UNN Jupiter fleet from the core of the Jovian systems, withdrawing to Jupiter's outer orbits. Formal declarations of war were decreed by the United Nations Security Council and Martian Defense Ministry as both planetary militaries mobilized for the first full-scale interplanetary conflict christened the UN-MCR war. After the Battle of Ganymede and Galilean Moons, the United Nations Navy had an active fleet of some 2,675 ships, with Mars consisting of 519 naval vessels. And that, ladies and gentle nerds, will set the stage for Part 2 of the UN-MCR War to be covered in the next video. This video expedition is part 4 of the Expanse Earth-Mars conflict series that will examine the first interplanetary war between the United Nations of Earth-Luna and the Mars Congressional Republic known as the UN-MCR War. Parts 1, 2, and 3 of the series covers the 150 years of the prior Cold War confrontations between both planetary superpowers opening with Martian independence and then the Vesta blockade into the prelude war shadow confrontation. 
adaptation for control of the protomolecule unfolding during seasons 1 and 2 with the in-universe timeline years of 2350 through 2351 that becomes the catalyst and directly leading into the UNMCR war at the start of 2352 Seoul. The after nearly two years of the proxy trade war and commerce raiding by privateer mercenary factions supported and armed by the governments of Earth and Mars spreading throughout the entire solar system, the trade network was drastically impacted by the loss of 3,000 merchant vessels making up 8% of the total transport fleet being either lost, raided, or destroyed. Outer planetary and belter factions have gained more influence in the past two years than the previous century combined, with over a thousand ships retrofitted for naval combat with point defense cannons, military grade torpedoes, and advanced defense systems throughout the various groups and tribes out of 100 factions consisting of small armadas with 5 to 20 ships each. Just over a third of the OPA factions side with the Martian Navy, a quarter support the forces of Earth, and the other 40% are independent equal opportunity raiders. In February 2352, after two years of the proxy commerce war and Battle of Ganymede after formal declarations of war were decreed from both interplanetary superpowers, the United Nations Navy consisted of 2,765 naval vessels making up nine primary fleets and four secondary fleets. 553 warships comprised that of the Mars Congressional Republic Navy maintaining five core fleets and three support fleets. The Martian ships hold the technological edge with newer and more advanced defense systems and stealth capabilities. The majority of Earth ships are older but have a significant numbers advantage by a factor of 5 to 1 with that of the Martian ships balancing the quantity versus quality naval doctrines placing an armed confrontation in the hands of military commanders and political decisions to determine which side will be victorious. The United Nations naval strategy and fleet order of battle is to engage in a war of attrition to dwindle Martian ship strength in a prolonged conflict where Earth's numerical advantage and large network of interplanetary infrastructure, shipyards, and production capabilities can outlast the less robust Martian economy, driving it into submission over an extended period of time. The United Nations has a system-wide network of eight major shipyards and a dozen dock relay ports, over three times that of the Martian infrastructure. The UNN deploys large fleet formations designed to draw out Martian forces into pitched naval battles with maneuvers bringing to bear overwhelming amounts of torpedoes and railgun volleys. The Mars Naval Defense Plan is to concentrate their navy in and around the proximity of MCR controlled space while performing hit and run stealth strikes with small and fast fleet elements and battle groups in conjunction and accompanied by attacks on lines of communications and fleet supply vessels. Tactically the goal is to damage and or destroy as many UN ships as possible through asymmetrical strikes utilizing withdrawals to avoid large scale battles when practical. Heavily defended bases, ports, and stations are used as staging points for strategic operations and tactical missions maneuvers to mount and coordinate offensive campaigns. The overall strategic goal is to inflict large amount of losses to UN fleets in a relatively short time frame on a practical level for MCRN situational operations, making it extremely costly for Earth to conquer Martian space and creating diminishing results on manpower, resources, and morale from swift and massive casualties breaking the United Nations resolve to continue the war. In February 2352, Earth was near apogee orbital separations with the Jovian systems of Jupiter and Saturn increasing UNN transit burns for fleet reinforcements from the inner planets compared to perigee position of Mars giving MCRN ships a greater advantage in speed and logistical fleet rotations between the Jovian systems. After the Battle of Ganymede, the UNN withdrew their Jupiter fleet from the Galilean orbits to a rendezvous with 65 5th Fleet ships after sustaining heavy combat losses throughout Jovian orbits, leaving the MCRN in firm control of Jupiter with a large concentration of ships supported by the large naval base on Callisto. 
Earth Fleet Command deployed their outer planetary 5th and Jupiter fleets for a combined offensive with the Saturn fleet on the Rhine system with 370 warships to drive the MCRN from orbit and resupply Titan naval base forcing Mars to choose between a large fleet engagement or giving up Saturn. The Phase 2 objective will be a combined assault on Jupiter with the joint inner and outer planetary forces to neutralize the Martian naval stronghold on Callisto. MCR Command would use their Saturn fleet of 50 ships as a delaying decoy action utilizing navigational advantages and signal intelligence to deploy battle groups and stealth squadrons as quick reaction forces performing hit and run strikes on UNN warships while disrupting supply lines, raiding support vessels and recovery ships undergoing long transit burns from the inner orbits. Over the next eight weeks, heavy fighting in the outer planets near Saturn resulted in 140 UNN ships lost or damaged in combat with 28 MCRN ship engagement casualties. In April 2352, 250 UNN ships from three fleets punched through the MCRN stealth ambushes despite heavy losses commencing the Saturn offensive as a well-executed MCRN withdrawal utilizing heavy railguns on small moons combined with a rearguard fleet action with fleet elements enabled all but 10 of the Martian ships to escape a large combined Earth naval force with hard burns towards Jupiter to regroup around the MCRN Galilean orbit strongholds. So far, fighting in the inner planets and asteroid belts have primarily revolved around commerce raiding and proxy combat engagements by Earth and Martian supported OPA factions to include frontline naval skirmishes due to the UN and MCR controlled belt territorial orbits being heavily defended by home and core fleets, tracking sensors, and networks of planetary railguns based on numerous asteroid belts and both planetary homeworlds. During the first four months of the war, including the battles of Ganymede and Jovian system, the United Nations Navy suffered 330 ships lost, missing, or damaged with a remaining combined fleet total of 2,515. Martian Republic naval losses consisted of 67 vessels for a total fleet of 506 ships. OPA Belter, Privateer, and Mercenary Faction casualties totaled 215 armed ships and 550 merchant and trade vessels lost, raided, or disabled. With the UNN committing such a large force towards the Outer Planetary Offensive, the MCRN deployed nearly half their fleets to defend the Jovian system and the critical naval base at Callisto. Despite Earth conceding Ceres Station to Mars, the largest trade hub in the asteroid belt, losing Jupiter would be a significant loss for the MCRN as a quarter of their ship production capacity is produced by the Callisto shipyards. Additionally, the Galilean moons are key gateways to the outer planetary trade networks. This would isolate the Martian economy to the asteroid belt's controlled orbits and territories, and without Jupiter, Earth could prolong the conflict and blockade Mars to their corner of the solar system, slowly chipping away at MCR space until the UN's interplanetary economy could strangle Mars into submission and win by simply building more ships over a prolonged war. Additionally, in a few months, Earth's network of shipyards and repair docks will be able to cycle back into service a significant amount of naval vessels that had been damaged during the early stages of the war. Despite MCRN Command's optimistic projections in their capacity to defend and hold the Callisto shipyards and Jovian system, Mars deployed half of their stealth ballistic missile platforms to the heart of UN-controlled space as a fallback plan if Jupiter was overrun. Five platforms with 10 Planet Buster missiles containing 20 nuclear warheads each were positioned around Earth and Luna for a first strike option with the capacity to overwhelm orbital defenses through salvos of 1,000 guided missiles designed to target UN command and control centers, inflicting enough damage that would allow Mars to successfully defend itself from an interplanetary nuclear response.
Shortly before the Callisto Offensive, Earth's watchtower surveillance networks detected two of the platforms enabling planetary railguns to destroy all five of the targets, but not before the fifth platform was able to launch a planet buster with one of the 20 nuclear warheads avoiding defense systems detonating on an Amazonian population center inflicting one million casualties. The other five MCRN stealth platforms were in defensive orbits around Mars, the asteroid belt, and Jupiter. Hygieia Station, operated by the Outer Planetary Alliance, was openly anti-colonial and hostile towards the United Nations prior to the Interplanetary War. When the conflict started, the station sided with Mars becoming a major weapons and logistics hub for privateer belter factions to raid and harass Earth trade and supply routes in the belt and outer planets that inflicted significant losses to UN merchant fleets. Shortly after the Battle of Saturn, the MCRN's second fleet element providing orbit security withdrew to protect Juno Station to fill MCR patrol zones as many ships were redeployed to defend the Jovian system, leaving only armed belter ships to protect the supply station. Earth Fleet Command exploited this shift of forces with a UNMC drop fleet deploying a battalion of assault marines to invade and neutralize the station's operational and dock facilities through precision drop troops intended to minimize civilian casualties. The UN task fleet swept aside the armed belter ships landing the 350 drop troops, but unbeknownst to Earth forces, two platoons of Martian marines had prepared hardened defenses and armed belters on the stations training them in basic combat arm tactics. The UN Marines had anticipated minor and uncoordinated resistance, allowing for engineers to place demolition charges, withdrawing and completing the mission in less than 24 hours. Instead, they faced heavily armed opposition with hard fighting on every level, securing only a portion of the objectives in the allotted mission window. After 72 hours of heavy fighting, the UN Marines were forced to withdraw from the station as the MCRN battle group and OPA escort ships were approaching orbit. Suffering significant casualties, the UN MC only disabled 20% of the station's critical objectives. Instead, the withdrawing UN Naval Assault Force unleashed salvos of torpedoes and railgun barrages to neutralize the military support facility, causing significant damage to the trade station's infrastructure, along with large numbers of civilian casualties. With the war now entering the decisive phase, the first two weeks of June 2352, Earth and Mars deployed more ships towards the Jovian system in preparation for the Battle of Jupiter centered around Callisto shipyards and the Martian naval base that was the key to controlling the Galilean orbit. Furthermore, UNN Security Force reinforcements secured the outer planetary trade routes as MCR-backed privateer factions withdrew towards the inner asteroid belt orbits due to the sheer numerical advantage held by Earth's naval patrol ships, placing more emphasis on the MCRN maintaining control of Jupiter's economic resources and strategic networks to sustain the ever-increasing likelihood of a drawn-out conflict. On Earth, at the District of New York, the Secretary General of the United Nations was due to address the Earth Luna Coalition Assembly with the state of interplanetary relations with the entire solar system, anticipating the dialogue's tone as both ends of the political spectrum eagerly awaited if their governmental influence had borne fruit, with rumors of a planetary nuclear exchange escalating as the war migrates towards the inner orbits. MCR officials were equally ready to dissect the Secretary General's message as a possible overtone towards negotiations or a firm resolve to continue the drums of war. After a standing ovation from some of the most influential members of the solar system, it was clear Earth would rely on military force to determine the war's outcome. After nearly two years of interplanetary conflict and war of attrition, the United Nations fleet capacity could field 842 warships for active frontline combat operations compared to that of 250 MCRN deployed naval vessels, decreasing Earth's previous 5 to 1 ship advantage to just over a 3 to 1 ratio of battle capable fleet strengths. 
Jupiter will determine which side will secure the advantage in the future course of the war. If the MCRN can maintain control of the Callisto naval base and shipyards and successfully defend the Galilean orbits, Mars will continue to have access to the outer planets with a stronghold in the primary Jovian system. However, if the United Nations Navy can neutralize Martian access to their primary naval base at Callisto, Earth fleets will be able to drive Martian presence from the Jovian system, thus securing the outer planets and begin blockading MCR-controlled space in the asteroid belt. The UNN allocated 400 warships from the Jovian fleets of Jupiter and Saturn and 5th and 8th fleets operating in the outer planets to attack the MCR-controlled Galilean orbits for the Jupiter offensive, converging from three orbit attack vectors with over 120 ships in each task force. Mars deployed 125 warships for defense with the Saturn and Jupiter fleets defending the primary orbits and 3rd tactical fleet performing a daring preemptive strike on two of the UNN battle armadas. The MCRN consolidated all available stealth warships from four fleets near Jupiter to make up 38 of the 57 3rd fleet ships for the campaign. The Mars stealth fleet split into two task forces containing four battle groups each to intercept the UNN battle formations of 240 ships transiting towards Jupiter from Saturn. The MCRN task fleets were guided by a stealth surveillance platform with long range tracking for precision targeting solutions on the enemy formations. The advanced stealth attacks inflicted heavy losses on the UNN fleets, destroying 65 ships and damaging 85 more until the element of surprise was lost amidst fleet-to-fleet -fleet engagements in which the Earth ships regrouped, eliminating 30 attacking ships and 4 battle groups and rendering 13 more non-mission capable along with destroying the MCRN stealth surveillance platform, leaving only 14 surviving 3rd fleet ships to withdraw from the battle zones. 65 of the UN naval vessels fought through the stealth ambush towards Jupiter with 25 more remaining to assist the 85 damaged ships and defend the area as it was common for MCRN raiders to lay in wait to attack the UNN fleet tenders and recovery ships. After the largest battle in solar system history, the UNN had 225 remaining warships for the outer Jovian offensive with the MCRN mustering 68 for defense. The UNN Vanguard fleet of 52 ships commanded by Admiral Souther encountered the MCRN Forward Task Force of 22 Jupiter ships led by Fleet Captain Carino on the edge of the Galilean orbits. Between Callisto and Io, a mutiny on board Earth's flagship, the Agatha Keen resulted in UNN ships firing upon each other. During the melee, 150 stealth missiles were launched by a rogue UN faction from the surface of Io armed with protomolecule warheads targeting Mars that would render the planet uninhabitable after impact, infecting the biosphere with protomolecule contaminants. Fred Johnson's OPA faction on Tycho Station in the asteroid belt intercepted the stealth torpedoes in transit with 30 captured UN interplanetary ballistic missiles, destroying the protomolecule debris with multiple nuclear fusion detonations sterilizing the proximity blast zones. The stealth targeting trajectories were relayed by an independent crew operating on board a privateer corvette in the Jovian area of operations. After action intelligence reports revealed shadow elements operating in the highest levels of both Earth and Martian governments were responsible for covert programs and operations that plunged the solar system into a two and a half year long conflict and interplanetary war. Multiple UN and MCR officials were implemented in the conspiracy and were forced to step down and or charged with treason. After the Battle of Io and destruction of the protomolecule stealth missiles, a ceasefire was ordered between the military forces and factions of Earth and Mars. Proceeding the discovery of the shadow governments, the UN General Assembly and MCR Parliament finalized a peace treaty officially ending hostilities between Earth and Mars in the UN-MCR interplanetary war. At the start of the conflict nearly three years prior, the United Nations Navy had an active fleet of 3,175 ships. The Mars Congressional Republic Navy was comprised of 635 vessels. 
In August 2352, the MCRN fleets had been reduced to 350 active naval vessels with 105 lost in action, 98 damaged, and 85 special operation privateer patrol boats destroyed or missing. That is a 32% casualty loss rate over the 32 month long conflict. The United Nations Navy consisting of, for the most part, older and less advanced fleets suffered a considerably higher amount of ships lost. 355 were destroyed or missing in action, 705 were rendered non-mission capable, and over 600 lightly damaged ships were withdrawn from active duty, leaving 1,545 available frontline vessels at war's end, amounting to a catastrophic 48% overall casualty rate. 450 damaged ships have been repaired by the UN's extensive network of shipyards and docks returning them to service during the ceasefire agreement, thus giving Mars military commanders a sigh of relief avoiding another six month of prolonged battles where Earth could use their economic power base of repairing increasing numbers of damaged ships to bear that would eventually overwhelm Mars naval production capacity. Through negotiations, Earth and Mars established a joint security force to research and regulate the newly formed Sol Ring Network, manifesting itself out of the Eros protomolecule impact crater on Venus, traveling to a stable orbit between Uranus and Neptune. The solar system's merchant and trade fleets also sustained a heavy reduction in transport and supply capacity. Pre-war, logistical ship numbers exceeded that of some 75,000 ships making the total number of merchant industry losses that of nearly 11,000, reducing the Sol System's combined logistical trade network by 15% to a total merchant fleet of 64,000, drastically affecting humanitarian supplies to the Belt and outer planets. Despite privateer and mercenary groups losing some 2,000 armed skiffs and frigates, OPA and Belter factions still have access to a reciprocal number of retrofitted gunships made possible through interplanetary arms manufacturers giving extreme influence to the post-war outer planetary alliance that now has the capacity to form their own independent naval force manifesting from Earth and Mars efforts to recruit contract ships as proxy commerce that eventually would play a part in the unintended outcome for the formation of the Free Navy. Over the span of the four-year-long interplanetary conflict and war, a major Earth population center was destroyed along with a primary asteroid belt Eros trade station knocked out of orbit and impacting on Venus. Ganymede and Hygieia stations lay in ruins as a result of three major combat engagements. The Martian moon of Deimos and Phoebe research station of Saturn were obliterated by planetary nuclear strikes. Four additional trade stations received collateral damage with nearly a dozen relay posts either destroyed or disabled. 3 million interplanetary civilians and colonists perished from Earth and Mars with a million more injured or missing. 1.5 million inhabitants of the belt and outer planets were listed as casualties with some estimates of nearly double that number. Additionally, 291,000 crew and ship personnel from the interplanetary navies and armed forces were lost in action as a result of the most catastrophic loss of life in the past 300 years of the solar system's history. Jinyuashi skut rasanate, tiki sasake fa sho taxtin de kango pain. Peace out. How's it everyone? It is my subjective viewpoint that The Expanse will return in the near future. But the best way to make this an objective reality is to post, share, blog, vlog, and all the other social media and conventional media acronyms to keep The Expanse trending. A simple thing all of us can do is to support and subscribe to content creators that promote our favorite science fiction franchise. Traffic drives the algorithm that influences the IP holder executives to create a new series for the expanse. Oye Dusta Inya and Belta Lodas to Nekang Zidop Di Mosca. Or as Uncle Mateo once said Uncle Mateo man has got to stand up. Someday things gonna change. The 
man's gonna stand up. 